Well, good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord. God is good. And shalom. God's peace. To everyone this morning, I thank the Lord for another day. He has brought us together. Uh, we had uh, some very inclement weather last Sunday, so we did not have service. And uh, that really threw me all the way off. <laughs> it really did. I'm so used to being here, so that's fine. So um, we're here, and God is good. So we want to continue doing God's work and God's will and blessing him uh, with what we say and what we do. So let us pray. Father, we thank you. We honor you. We praise you for all that you've done, the things you're doing, things yet to be done. I thank you for every soul that has come out this morning, Father God, to come into your house of worship, your house of prayer that we may be able to receive your words, so that we can apply it to our lives and work the work, God, that you've set before us so that we can be strong and courageous to win every battle, every fight against the enemy and do things that will please you or upbuild your kingdom and help draw all men unto you as we lift up that mighty name of Jesus. Bless those that are yet still coming, traveling mercies, those that couldn't make it. Father, let this word reach them. Uh, by your means and let them be uh, blessed because of it. Let us hide thy word in our hearts that we might not sin against you, but that we'll take it, we'll give it away to those that hunger and thirst after your righteousness so that they can be filled. And we'll glorify your name and honor you in what we say and what we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, God is good. We've been... Um, dealing with, uh, I believe, a lot of warfare. Uh, I have uh, preached and taught on warfare, and uh, I think it's time to go back to, because I do believe that each and every one of us have some battles in our lives that we need to um, fight. Um, not run away from, but be diligent to meet them and be prepared to not just fight, but be prepared to win. Um, there is such a movement uh, going on in the generation today that, um, and I even took a course when I was working for a company that said not everyone gets a trophy. And there's such a movement that everybody gets a trophy, no matter what happens. Winners, losers, no matter, as long as you participate, everybody gets a trophy. And that is so defeating. Because we have to learn that there are times we're going to lose. And when we lose, we need to use those opportunities to learn from what happens so that we don't lose again because Trust me, the battle's coming back around. The enemy does not just knock you down and go away. He's coming back. Because his whole thought process, his whole demeanor is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And as long as you got breath, as long as you have movement, he feels his job is not done until you are dead. So therefore, we have to learn how to defeat the enemy. When you get knocked down, you gotta learn how to get back up. We have to learn that there are times when the enemy's strong power will come upon us when we are at our weakest points. We're in our uh, times when we have not prepared ourselves for the battle. We don't think it's even common. We're lulled into false senses of security. Because it doesn't seem like anything bad has happened. And when you let your guard down, that's when the enemy is using his tactics to beat you at your lowest and knock you down and knock you out. He brings a lot of trouble. Just like we 
learned on our last lesson, it is time to trouble your trouble. Yes. Now, y'all know me. I love my Christmas movies. And my favorite Christmas movie is Christmas Story. This is one of my favorite parts of the story. When Ralphie has had enough of Scott Farkas. Scott can hit him with a snowball. Scott took his friends and beat his friends up. Scott humiliated him in front of folk. Scott was a constant thorn in Ralphie's flesh. And I want you to think about this because what has the enemy done to you? Yeah. What has the enemy tried to take away from you? Has your peace been taken? See, Scott took Ralphie's peace. Has your hope been dashed? Scott took Ralphie's hope. Has the enemy taken your security? Ralphie's security was taken. But it came time at his lowest point when discouragement set in and Ralphie had enough. And it was time to trouble his trouble. And if you've ever seen the story, if you ever know, that was it. Each of us, I believe, have come to a point and time in our lives when enough is enough. Amen. And you just ain't going to take it no more. But you have to realize where is your trouble coming from? A lot of times we turn that trouble over or we turn our focus on to something that's not really the trouble because we don't want to deal with the trouble. We want to use something outside of that to focus our anger on or someone else to focus our anger on instead of actually dealing with the problem or the spirit that has actually caused the trouble in your life. Ralphie said, uh-uh. He beat poor Scott Farkas up so bad that everybody Scott had ever messed with realized that he wasn't worth a dime. And that's what we need to do to the enemy that, follow, that messes with us. Is trouble our trouble. The children of God, we have to learn how to go on the offense and begin to fight to take everything back that the enemy has stolen or has taken from us. Our peace, our security, our trust in God. Our belief that God is with us, and no matter how bad things seem to be, no matter how much the enemy tries to pour down or rain down his terror upon our lives, that God will not allow him to destroy us. And it's time for us to fight back and be victorious over every situation and every circumstance. See, God has equipped us with an awesome arsenal. He's given us the word of God, faith, love, and a sound mind to defeat the devil and claim the victory over every situation and every circumstance. So what we're going to do this morning, we're going to look at two of God's chosen warriors who had to overcome the odds that were stacked against them and defeat the enemy and take back what was stolen from them. Hands, hands, hands. Has anybody, anybody ever had anything stolen from you? Yeah. Michelle and I have had our house broken into. I've had my car broken into before. I've had people steal things from me. And trust me, that is not a good feeling. You feel as though all your safety is now gone out the window. Yeah. You're constantly unaware. You're constantly uh, in jitters and you don't know what to do. You don't know who has done it. 
So you don't know where to go, even go to try to get satisfaction or even try to get your stuff back. There's a difference in the situation of when we're dealing with the devil because we know who took our stuff. We know who has troubled our lives. And we have the ability and the arsenal to get that back. Don't let him take all your stuff and keep your stuff and you just sit around going, woe is me. That's not what God has equipped you to do. God has equipped you with power and authority to defeat the enemy over every situation and every circumstance. It's time for us to get busy. Amen. So let's look at Gideon. In Judges, the sixth chapter, verses one through seven. So then once again, the Israelites started disobeying the Lord so he let the nation of Midian control Israel for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that many Israelites ran to the mountains and hid in caves. Every time the Israelites would plant crops, the Midianites invaded Israel together with the, Amal with the Amalekites and other eastern nations. So see, it wasn't just the Midianites. You had so many different groups that understood and knew that the Israelites had been blessed by God. They all had heard the stories about how God had delivered uh, Israel out of the hands of Pharaoh. How he had given them the land, a promise. But see, once Israel started to disobey God, God had to do something in order to let them understand that I've given you some laws. I've given you some word. I've told you before that if you do this and do that and continue to obey and follow my word, I'm going to prosper you. I'm going to keep you from all harm. I'm going to set you up. But as soon as you turn and start uh, uh, worshiping other gods, you're going to be in trouble. This is exactly what the Israelites did. Says they rode in on cam their camels, set up their tents, and then let their livestock eat the crops as far as the town of Gaza. The Midianites stole food, sheep, cattle, and donkeys. Like a swarm of locusts, they could not be counted, and they ruined the land wherever they went. The Midianites took almost everything that belonged to the Israelites, and the Israelites begged the Lord for help. I find it so interesting that a lot of times we don't even come to God until we get in trouble. Until things start happening. And what we do is we begin to look at circumstances and try to blame bad things on circumstances without realizing that, just as it was in the first verse, the Israelites disobeyed God. They started to worship other gods. They had set up altars to Baal. They allowed other outside influences to come in and keep them from worshiping the true God that kept them safe from all harm. What has entered into our lives that we've allowed to come in and keep us from keeping our minds stayed on God? What have we allowed to come in that we actually worship outside of worshiping the true God? And when things go wrong, then we want to look at a situation and say, well, you know, he or she or it did such and such and such and such, and this is why I'm in the bad situation I'm in. But we have to realize and remember, what have we done? See, God is a God of love and compassion, but God is also a God who's going to make you obey him. If you don't obey him, he's going to leave you to your own devices. Michelle asked me a question this morning. Because I think she had seen something on the net. And um, I think the question was, um, 
to the point of God will break you down in order to remake you. And she asked me if God would do that. And I was kind of busy doing something, so I gave her a rush answer and said, no, God won't do that. But then as I began to prepare and get myself ready, God had to let me know. God may not break you down, but sometimes God will leave you to your own devices when you do things that are disobedient to him. Amen. That's not God that's breaking you down. You break your own self down. You allow things to come in and distract you from doing what you need to do. Yes. You become weak. You do not allow the strength of God to begin to work in your life. And before you know it, you have been broken down. Amen. See, it all depends upon you. If God has given you a word, if God has given you something to do, and you decide you don't want to do it, and God needs you to do it, God may have to take a stronger measure to you. How do you know that? Because it happened to me. I lost two jobs. Two jobs. That I had planned on retiring from because God said to do such and such. And those jobs were taken away. And I had to learn. God had a plan for my life. And I decided in me, I wasn't going to do it. And when God breaking me down, God just made an opportunity happen to where I had to realize that God, yep, I got to do what you tell me to do. It wasn't a breakdown of my life. Because even through all of that, God still sustained me, but he wanted to teach a lesson. That even in the midst of turmoil and trouble, God can still bless and keep you. And give you what you need. So I'm reading in all this, and Gideon had to realize that in all of this trouble that was coming, Gideon actually looked around and saw that the people had built up these altars to Baal. They were disobeying God. So what did Gideon do? Gideon went and tore down every last one of them. He busted up their worship to the other gods. Because he understood and realized that part of the catalyst of us being destroyed happened to be because we were not obedient to God. And we got to do something. So in Judges 6, verse 11 through 14, it says, One day an angel from the Lord went to the town of Ophrah and sat down under the big tree that belonged to Joash, a member of the Abizari clan. Joash's son Gideon was nearby, threshing grain in a shallow pit where he could not be seen by the Midianites. Then the angel appeared and spoke to Gideon. The Lord is helping you, and you are a strong warrior. Now, if you're out somewhere hiding because you're afraid, and the angel comes and tells you that you're a strong warrior, I think that seems like that's a conflict of interest in your mind. Why would you send somebody to tell me I'm strong and I'm hiding, especially in a place where I shouldn't be in the first place? It says, but Gideon answered, please do not take this wrong. But if the Lord is helping us, then why are all these awful things happening? We've heard how the Lord performed miracles and rescued our ancestors from Egypt. But those things happened long ago. Now the Lord has abandoned us to the Midianites. Then the Lord himself said, Gideon, you will be strong because I am giving you the power to rescue Israel from the Midianites. That's pretty strong. First you then went back to God and said, look, now we all know what you did for us, but that was a long time ago. How many times have we looked way back on when God blessed us, but it seemed like he hadn't blessed us since? And we kind of get discouraged because we were so used to a good blessing, and then all of a sudden it's like things dried up. But again, we forget where we were during the time of that dry season. What were we doing? 
when we continuing to allow and see God's awesome blessings on us? Or were we so consumed with the things of the world and putting ourselves into positions to where we were not focused on God and seeing even the small blessings that God has given to us? See, we want to see the big grandiose. But guess what? He woke you up this morning. That's a blessing. If you ate breakfast this morning, you had some food to eat. Some people didn't have that this morning. What a blessing. So see, if you think these things happened a long time ago, God is trying to tell you, listen, I'm always here. I've always been here. I'm going to continue to be here. But you've got to start focusing on where you are in me and realize I've made you strong. I've given you equipment. I've uh, planned your victorious battle. But you've got to get up and you've got to get going. Because I don't need you weak and feminine. I need you strong and powerful. Yeah. So going into Judges 7, 15 to 22, before we even get there, there's a little bit of a backstory. Gideon had formed together an army. He even called upon some of the other tribes to come and join him. Because God had infused him and given him enough word to get him back strong and courageous. So what he had done was he took 32,000 men to go into battle. God told Gideon, hey, that's too many men. But you got 32 but you're looking at an army composed, composed of probably, I don't know, maybe 150,000, 200,000 men that you've got to go into battle with. God said, you got too many. Send some home. When he first told him, 22,000 men left, leaving Gideon with only 10,000 men. God said, that's still too many. What would you do? You got 10,000 men going up against 150 to 200,000 men, and God still tells you that's too many. <laughs> Would you quake a little bit? Yeah. Would you shake a little bit? But God is still encouraging you, telling you, I'm not going to let you die. Scott so says, I tell you what you do. You take this 10,000, you take them down to this river, and you cause them to drink. Every man that puts his head down into the water and drinks, you send them home. Everyone who cups the water in their hands and puts it up to their face and drinks, that's who you take. Only 300 men cupped their hands with water and made them drink. And I began to wonder, Lord, why? What's, what's the difference? They drank water. Here's the difference. Every man that put his head down could never see anything that was going on. You couldn't see if the enemy was going to attack. You take your eyes off the battle. But everyone who dipped their hands down in could survey everything and still be able to be quenched with what God had provided for them. God does not want you always looking down. God wants you to face the battle. God wants you to see the battle. God wants you to prepare for the battle so he can quench you and prepare you to go into battle with your eyes wide open. Amen. He doesn't want you fearful. He wants you so ready to do his work and will that you won't be afraid anymore. So, God had told Gideon, sneak into the camp. If you're still afraid, sneak into the camp. I want you to, I got something for you to see. So when Gideon and one of his high soldiers went into the camp, they overheard two of the enemy's men talking about a dream. One man said, listen, I just had this dream. A flat loaf of bread rolled down the hill and it ran into the captain's tent the general's tent and roll over all the army. This was a dream. And the other soldier that he was talking to said, well, you know, actually, 
But that sounds like it's the God of Israel is going to come and flatten out all of us and kill us because we already know how powerful Israel, Israel's army is. That was just enough for Gideon to gain strength and know that God was with him. God will prepare you for a battle. God will tell you what's about to happen before it happens. If you have your ears tuned to God's voice, he'll let you know what's going to happen. And you need to prepare to get yourself ready for that battle. So as soon as Gideon heard about the dream and what it meant, he bowed down to praise God. Then he went back to the Israelite camp and shouted, let's go. The Lord is going to let us defeat the Midianite army. David divided his little army into three groups of 100 men. And he gave each soldier a trumpet and a large clay jar with a burning torch inside. Gideon said, when we get to the enemy camp, spread out and surround it. Then wait for me to blow a signal on my trumpet. As soon as you hear it, blow your trumpets and shout, fight for the Lord. Fight for Gideon. Gideon and his group reached the edge of the enemy camp a few hours later after dark. Just after the new guards had come on duty. Gideon and his soldiers blew their trumpets and smashed the clay jars that were hiding in the, hiding the torches. The rest of Gideon's soldiers blew the trumpets that were holding in their right hands, and then they smashed the jars and held the burning torches in their left hands. Everyone shouted, fight with your swords for the Lord and for Gideon. The enemy soldiers started yelling and tried to run away. Gideon's troops stayed in their positions surrounding the camp and blew their trumpets again, as they did the Lord, I like that you got to hear this, the Lord made the enemy soldiers pull out their swords and start fighting each other. <laughs> the enemy army tried to escape from the camp. They ran to Acacia tree town toward Zerida, and as soon as the edge of the land that as far as the edge of the land that belonged to the town of Abel Mohola near Talith. See, a lot of times you think you've got to fight your own battle, and sometimes God's going to cause the enemy to destroy himself. Amen. For you. We try to depend too much on our own strength and our own mind, but God is trying to tell you cast your cares and your burdens upon him. And let him do the work that's going to bless you and give you what you need. God made sure that they not only defeated the enemy, but they got back everything that was stolen. Kicked the enemy out, and they never came back and bothered them again. What do you need to be delivered from today? What battles are you going through? Who's troubling you? Remember, it's not a person. It's a spirit. And if you're not targeting the spirit, you're battling the wrong battle. God wants you free. God wants you delivered so that you can do the things that God needs for you to do. Second, let's talk about David. 1 Samuel 30, 1-5. It says, it took David and his men three days to reach Ziklag. But while they, were, but while they had been away, the Amalekites had been raiding in the desert land around there. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it to the ground and had taken away the women and the children. Not only had they burned the town, but they took away all of the fighting men's women and all their children. What would you do if somebody came and took your children? Men, what would you do if they came and took your wife? So you gotta be careful who you talk that to because some men would say, hey. <laughs> New day. <laughs> but it says when David and his men came to Ziklag and they saw the burned out ruins and learned that their families had been taken captive, they started crying and kept it up until they were too weak to cry anymore. David's two wives, Ahinoam and Abigail, had been taken captive with everyone else. So the enemy wants to take everything from you. He wants you 
The things that you hold dear, most dear, he wants to destroy. He wants you in such a state to where you lose consciousness of God. He said, hey, but these men cried so much that they couldn't cry anymore. You open up your mouth, not a sound comes out. You squeeze your eyes, not another tear drops. But the pain and the anguish is still there because you have been knocked off your horse. So David was desperate. His soldiers were so upset at what had happened to their sons and daughters that they were thinking about stoning David to death. But he felt the Lord giving him strength. I think one version says David encouraged himself in the Lord. And he said to the priest, Abiathar, let's ask God what to do. Abiathar brought everything he needed to get answers from God, and he went over to David. Then David asked the Lord, should I go after the people who raided our town? Can I catch up with them? Go after them, the Lord answered. You will catch up with them, and you will rescue your families. Amen. Ask God what to do. Don't try to figure out what you think you want to do. It's easy for us when we have issues and we have problems to try to calculate the best move to make. Well, I think I should do this, or I think I should do that, or I should go here, or I should go there, or I should call so-and-so, or I need to consult with so-and-so. What you need to do exactly what David did, go before the Lord. Father, what do you want me to do? Should I make this move? I know I got this in my mind, but should I make this move? And God will give you an answer. It's either going to be, yes, make that move, or no, I need you to do this. He's not going to just say no and not give you another way to do something. But you need to go to him and allow him the opportunity to tell you what you need to do and the next step you need to make. 1 Samuel 30, 16 and 20 says, And he led David unto the Amalekites. They were eating and drinking everywhere, celebrating because of what they had taken from Philistia and Judah. David attacked them just before sunrise the next day and fought until sunset. You got a whole day of fighting. 400 Amalekites rode away on camels, but they were the only ones who escaped. David rescued his two wives and everyone else the Amalekites had taken from Ziklag. No one was missing, young or old, sons or daughters. David brought back everything that had been stolen, including their livestock. David also took the sheep and the cattle that the Amalekites had with them, but he kept these separate from the others. Everyone agreed that, those, that these would be David's reward. We are to attack the enemy with all the power and might that God has endued us with. Just like these two mighty warriors who sought God's help, went on the offensive and defeated the enemy, we are to do the very same thing. We have the same abilities to fight these fights. We are not to be destroy or allow ourselves to be put down. God does not love David or Gideon any more than he loves you. When we learn to attack, when we learn to get up off of our do-nothing seats and put in a plan of action that God has given us, you are guaranteed victory. How do you know that? Because the Bible says so. Because God has done it before. And if he's done it before, he'll do it again. And he can do it for you. Second Corinthians 10, 4 through 6. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, 
casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. We have to realize that the weapons that we use in this warfare, it's not a gun, it's not a knife, it's not your fist. The weapons that we use are God's weapons. Because the fights we fight, it's not against flesh and blood. We gotta realize that there are strongholds that have us in captivity that we need to have blocked. We need to have torn down. What do you mean I'm a Christian? I can't be in captivity. Yes, you can. Because you put yourself there. You become so weak, you become so uh, uh, distracted from keeping your mind and your abilities on God, just like the children of Israel did. We build up other gods in our lives, other things that we want to do, other things that distract us and keep us from actually serving and worshiping God. And therefore, we find ourselves in a stronghold, in a captive state, because we can't break loose until we realize that it is the enemy that has put us in these positions by using his deceitful tactics and making us think that these things are better than the God we serve, then you gotta do just like Gideon did. Go in and break down those altars. Go in and smash up those other gods and make your life much better. You do that. See, we want to wait. We want God to do it. But God has already told you, I've given you everything you need. Why don't you use the tools I've given you? We have to cast down arguments. Everything that comes up against us, the enemy tries to utilize and say, well, you know, it's really this. No. It's okay to act this way. It's okay to do that. We should all just get along. We need to be inclusive in everything. No. We need to set some standards. We need to break all those arguments down and put them against the word of God who tells you to honor the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Love him. Worship him. All other things are man-made. Fleshly desires to have no place in the kingdom of God, then you can make sure that you've put into captivity that which has captured you. We've been given the authority through the power of the Holy Spirit to fight and defeat the devil and his plots and his ploys. You need the authority to do that. And you've been given that. Time to utilize it. So Mark 11, 22 to 23 says, So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. I find it so interesting that it's four little words that will cause you to do great and mighty things. Have faith in God. He said, for surely I say unto you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. What are the mountains in your life? What are the things that have come up that are defeating you from reaching your goals? You need to say to them, get up, get gone, be gone. And you only do that when you have faith in God. It's time for you to trouble your trouble. Time for you to knock it out the park. I love how the story of David and Goliath ended. See, we all want to just think that David hit him with a rock and he fell. But see, you got to keep reading. So David then went and took Goliath's sword and cut his head off. Making sure that there was no more Gideon going to get back up. See, that's the problem. We want to hit the devil with a rock. Or with just something that just stuns him. But each time you cut his head off, Get rid of those things that are keeping you from being 
all that God needs you to be. Cut it off. And let God show you victory. Nothing like it. Nothing like being victorious over something. Nothing like knowing that you have defeated the enemy when he has come against you. Nothing, there's nothing sweeter than that. I think it's next Sunday. It's Super Bowl Sunday. And whoever wins, don't know. But I guarantee you, whoever's going to win, sweet victory. They'll dance. They'll pop champagne. They'll holler and scream and streamers will fly. Nothing like victory. Well, honey, it's the same thing with you. When you know you've defeated the enemy over a situation, there's nothing like it. You can glorify in God knowing that he has blessed you to have reached the point to where the enemy is not going to bother you with that situation anymore. Amen? Amen. Trouble, your trouble. I want to thank you for watching this video. I pray that you were blessed by it, that it encourages you to have a deeper relationship with God, that you continue to fight the good fight of faith and grow strong and courageous in your daily battles with the enemy. I encourage you to subscribe to our page, like us on Facebook, and log on to our website. There you can submit a prayer request and support this ministry through a financial gift. And remember, if each one can reach one, and a reached one can reach one, then a one one will have one one, and the kingdom will have been advanced one soul at a time. Thank you, and have a great day.